Chapter 8, Setting Up a Moral System, Basic Assumptions and Basic Principles. We've arrived at what the authors of our textbook would no doubt say is the most important chapter of the book. In other words, everything they've said so far was to set up what they're about to say in Chapter 8. To help you understand or visualize the importance of Chapter 8, I put together a, a little visual. In Chapters 1 through 7, the authors have critiqued all other ethical theories, and they've talked about a number of related subjects, and they've critiqued uh, thinking on these subjects as well. After Chapter 8, we're going to enter a section of the textbook in which we're going to be looking at practical applications. And what the authors of our textbook would hope is that we will take the theory that they present in Chapter 8 and apply it to all the different modern ethical problems that we're going to be discussing throughout the rest of this course. So Chapter 8 is the golden link that ties the book together. This is a chapter in which Jot Thoreau's theory, known as humanitarian ethics, is going to be presented. In introducing Chapter 8, the co-author of our textbook, Keith Krausman, writes, At this point in a course of ethics, or in most texts on ethics, students usually throw up their hands in frustration, saying, if all ethical theories and systems are so full of problems, then perhaps there is no such thing as a workable and meaningful moral system. Perhaps morality is relative to whoever sets it up and to no one else. Krausman continues, Jacques Thoreau believed that we can attempt to show the way toward building a moral system that is workable, not only for many individuals, but also for most, if not all, human beings. Accordingly, Thoreau's theory of humanitarian ethics marks an important contribution to the study of morality and the entire field of ethics. Well, let me pause at this point and make a, a couple of comments. Krausman, based on his experience as a college professor, notes that at this point in the course, his students have thrown up their hands in frustration and they have wondered whether it, it was possible to put together any kind of moral or ethical theory that would be workable and meaningful. It would be my hope that if you've listened to these lectures, you are not at that point. Because the history of the human race has taught us that uh, the human race has had any number of workable and meaningful moral systems. Sure, none of them are perfect, because after all, we are human beings, and so we, being mortal and being prone to error, uh, are often going to make mistakes along the way. But this does not mean that society's never had a moral system that's worked or that was meaningful for them in their historical or cultural context. What I'm saying is the human race was not desperately waiting for the nativity of Jacques Thoreau so that he could show them the way or building a moral system that would be workable. But I want you to notice the section of this quotation that I've underlined, because it's very ambitious. Jacques Thoreau believed he can attempt to show the way toward building a moral system that is workable. Okay, if the period was there, we would say, okay, that's fine. But you see the ambitious ambition here. He not only wants to come up with a system that works, but that would work for the entire human race. And this ties back into our last lecture. There was an attempt to do this with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The problem with that, and we talked about a number of problems, but the primary problem with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that it wasn't, and it isn't, really universal. And if a new global order is to be formed, if we are going to become a world community, a united nations with all of the nations of the world being state, states similar uh, to the United States and its relationship to the federal government of the United States. If we're going to come up with a united nations, then we are going to have to come up with a, a workable moral system 
that works not just for many, but for most of the world, or if not all human beings. Now Thoreau modestly believed that he had come up with such a system. And his theory of humanitarian ethics then marks an important contribution to the study of morality in the entire field of ethics. And it does, in fact. But I'm going to be arguing that his theory is ultimately no more universal than the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a theory that I believe is now the dominant moral theory in the West. And there are other moral theoreticians who have come up with similar theories. But the basic premises of Jacques Thoreau certainly are dominant in the United States of America. And they are dominant in Western Europe. But there is great resistance to this Western thinking among the peoples of the rest of the world, the majority world, the 84% of this world that is not secular in its moral thinking. We'll be talking about that as we go along. How do Thoreau and Kraussman suggest that we go about building a moral system that is workable for not only many individuals, uh, but for most, if not all, of the human race. Well, the authors of our textbook propose that we should arrive at this system that will work for the world by arriving at a reasonable synthesis, by combining what is best in all of the ethical systems and theories we've examined, whether they be religious, non-religious, consequentialist, non-consequentialist, individualistic, uh, i.e. intuitionist, or altruistic. And by doing this, they hope that we can arrive at a common moral ground, while at the same time dealing with or eliminating the problems that are inherent in all of these other systems. Let me visualize what they are proposing here. Imagine a table full of moral systems. Uh, they're mechanical devices in this illustration, and you can detach parts and attach other parts. And so the authors are proposing that we go to each of these systems separately and say, what are the good things about these systems that we want to retain? And then what are the problems with these systems that we want to eliminate? And so we unscrew the problems and we toss them in the dumpster and we put what is left back on the table. After we've gone through all of the systems that we've discussed in these books and perhaps some others that we have not discussed, we then take and combine them. We may have to weld some of them to make them fit. Others we can perhaps screw into place but voila, at the end of the day, we offer you then a, a synthesis of all the systems we've talked, all of the bad eliminated, all of the good retained. I would note that they're not going to retain very much from the religious theories of religion, uh, from traditional theories of religion. Uh, you won't find much of the divine rule system or natural law system in their uh, new creation. Those things will have been tossed into the dumpster. And that's the problem. That's why the system being proposed here cannot attain to the universality that the authors believe it can attain and to. Uh, because 84% of the world is still traditional. They are still religious. They still have a religious foundation uh, for their moral thinking and their ethical judgments. And religion is perhaps going out of style in the Western world, but it is growing exponentially in the rest of the world. So this creates a bit of a problem. It seems to me that you're not going to attain to universality if you th throw away the very basis by which most of the world makes its moral and ethical judgments. More on this later. Before 
introducing their system before presenting their synthesis. The authors of our text identify or attempt to deal with several conflicting moral issues that they uh, contend must be resolved or synthesized before they can present an outline of their own moral system. So there are things on the table that we're either going to have to put together first before we examine these other systems, or we're going to have to at least solve the problems they create. The authors of our textbook begin by addressing the conflict between consequentialism and non-consequentialism. And they write, we must consider the consequences of our decisions, acts, and rules, but at the same time be aware of and avoid the end justifies the means problem. Even a good end does not always justify the means or the motives leading to it. Something interesting to note here. The authors are not approaching this process of synthesizing value-free. In the illustration we, we've given you, there's a table full of moral systems, and they're going to approach this table and remove those things that they see as problematic, put those things in the dumpster, and retain the things that they believe to be good. But we have to ask, how do you decide that? Obviously, you must have some standard you're using to make that basic determination between that which is worthy of retaining and that which should be put in the dumpster. Well, here, as they approach the problem of consequentialism versus non-consequentialism, uh, they give us a glimpse into their own value system. And we discover that they are more or less utilitarian. They state that their system is going to be a system that considers the consequences of decisions, acts, and rules. So they are going to argue that we must consider the consequences. Uh, okay, we pointed out that all moral systems do that. The old divine rule system considered the consequences. The divine rule consequentialist just believes that the consequences of obeying God are always going to be better than the consequences of disobeying him. So it is not that non-consequentialists are non-concerned with the consequences of their decisions, acts, or rules. Uh, but that is not what the author is talking about. He does not want to retain that kind of consequential concern. He is clearly stating here, or uh, if both authors wrote this or had a part in writing this, uh, he is clearly stating here that his theory is going to be a consequentialist theory. So he is going to accept one of the strong critiques of consequentialism that utilitarianism often makes morality just a... a bookkeeping choice. You figure your ledger, you decide what is uh, to your ultimate advantage, what is likely to result in the best consequences, and you go ahead and do that thing. And of course the criticism of that is, well, you can justify anything. And the authors say, okay, we're going to recognize that problem, and so we're going to present a moral system that we believe addresses that particular problem, because we don't uh, want morale to be, morality to be a, a, a bookkeeper's problem, a matter of accounting. And we do want to avoid the problem that we can justify anything. So they are going to try to have a consequentialism with certain things tied down so the consequentialism does not become a slippery slope that ends up being a, a totally moral neutral and sometimes a morally harmful theory if it is in the hands of the wrong person. 
The authors then attack the problem of self versus other interestedness. This is the problem between egoethicism and utilitarianism. And they point out that there are problems, and they pointed them out with the libertarian philosophy, the totally self-interested approach to morality. And therefore, Trump agrees with the utilitarian approach of doing what is in the best interest of everyone. Again, Thoreau and Kraussman are identifying themselves as utilitarians. They are going to present a modified form of utilitarianism, and it is going to have certain elements, strong elements, of individualism in it. And so they are not going to throw everything the ego ethicist stands for off the table. They're going to retain a great deal of that. But they are going to be primarily uh, community focused. There's also the conflict between act and rule. In a moral system, you want to allow people the authors write, and most would agree, you want to uh, provide the individual with the greatest freedom of action possible. And yet, you also want to have some stability and order in your culture. So you don't want to have absolute moral anarchy because then you would have an instability and who knows what would result from that moral instability. Moral anarchy as a system uh, doesn't work. It is does not provide a glue to hold the culture uh, together. In fact, it's just the opposite. It, it di dissolves the glue that holds us together, and everyone is acting for themselves, everyone doing right in their own eyes. And the authors say, no, we don't want to go that. We pointed out earlier that that's one of their two great fears. Uh, so they want to provide a lot of individual freedom in their moral system. But they want the stability and order that you had with the old divine rule system. Uh, rule non-consequentialism. This is about the only thing they, they're going to retain from that old system. They're going to look at uh, that which has historically served as the moral compass for all peoples throughout all of history, and they're going to say, you know, we're going to remove all of the religious aspect of that because we reject the idea that any uh, supernatural theory is rational. I think that's nonsense, but that's where they're at. But man, we like the stability. Everyone knew what the rules were, and it provided uh, the cultures uh, that bought into some sort of supernatural theory uh, regarding the origins of morality with a, a stable system that was able to be passed on from generation to generation. There was order. And so we want that. We're going to throw everything else out, but we do want to have within our system enough rule, uh, enough predictability, enough fences, to provide society with stability. So, so we're going to put together, to use an illustration, I don't know if any of you have ever put together model cars, model airplanes, but there's a way of doing it and there's a way not to do it. Now, when I was a kid, I did it the wrong way. I put a lot of glue on because I wanted those parts to hold together. But if I were to do it today, that's not my particular hobby, but if I were to do it today, I would be very sparing with the glue. Because the whole idea of the model is when it's done, it is to look like the thing that's being modeled. If I'm doing an X-15, I want it to look like an X-15. I want it to hold together, but I want to have a bunch of glue sticking out all over the place. And I don't want the surface of the model destroyed by the acid in the glue that holds the things. It melts the plastic to hold it together. So I want to be really sparing. I want the model I put together, my F-15, to be stable so that I can maybe hang it from the ceiling with a wire, whatever you do with, with these models. 
but I, I don't want it to be stable at the point it, to the point that it, it, someone looks at it and says, you just used way too much glue here. So that's what the authors are going for. They want a moral system that has some glue so that society is held together and not torn apart. But they want to have the maximum about, uh, amount of individual freedom of action possible. The next conflict the authors of our textbook attempt to address is the conflict between emotion and reason. Now, by emotion, they're referring to intuitionism or natural law theory, and they have dismissed intuitionism as emotionalism. We've tried to make the case that there is a good empirical basis for believing that we are born with moral pre-wiring, that everyone in the world has more or less the same moral wiring. We referred to the work of Jonathan Haidt. We've pointed out the Yale baby studies. And so we have attempted to show that there is a good empirical and rational case that can be made for intuitionism. It isn't just emotion. And those who hold to intuitionism or to its cousin, natural law theory, we should perhaps refer to natural law theory as its older cousin, the people that hold to those theory are not necessarily be, being driven by their emotions. Uh, the moral intuitions that we all seem to have seem to be very much reasonable when one examines them. Well, the authors say, we, we want reason. So they have identified themselves as more or less utilitarianisms, uh, utilitarianists, and, and now they are identifying themselves as rationalists. They, and, and empiricists, they, they would have both. So, so they say that our system is going to be based on reason rather than emotion, but we don't want to exclude emotion. They do want people to have a sense of moral outrage when they see someone breaking the rules of the system. That's necessary if the rules are going to work. If, for example, we have a stop sign that exists in the middle of a country road, not even at an intersection, for no apparent reason. Uh, we have no real emotional problem unless we are just absolute legalists when we're driving with someone who ignores that sign. And if that was the road we traveled every day, we would be uh, ignoring it too because there is no um, parent reason for the sign and seeing someone break that particular law and not stop at that sign does not fill us with moral outrage. In fact, we might be uh, feel moral outrage if we saw someone pulled over by a highway patrolman and given a tickle, ticket for not stopping at that stupid sign. And so in order for a system of morality to work, you have to have some, some rules that are understood, and we're going to get to that. And uh, people should feel good about themselves emotionally when they keep the rules. They should feel good about others when they notice that they keep the same rules. And they should have a sense of moral outrage when they see someone break the rules. So the author says, we want reason-based rules. Uh, but we want that moral outrage. So we're going to keep that from the old system, uh, from intuitionism. We do like that. Having addressed certain conflicts that have been pointed out throughout the course of our study, the authors are now going to present their basic assumptions. Now, you may have noticed that I underlined that word with my voice. Why did I do that? Well, what is an assumption? An assumption is something you cannot conclusively prove. The authors have had real problems with 
other systems because these other systems are set upon a foundation of assumptions that cannot be conclusively proven. Earlier, they said that their own theories are also based on certain assumptions about the nature of moral propositions that cannot be conclusively proved. And now they acknowledge that their theory is going to rest on a foundation of assumptions that they're not going to prove, that they cannot prove, that they're going to assume to be true. So logically speaking, what makes this theory any better than the theories they've disparaged? Uh, they have said they cannot accept intuitionism because it cannot be conclusively proven that we human beings have moral intuition. Well, we pointed out that the evidence is now showing that we do. And they rejected the divine rule theory or the supernatural theory because the supernatural cannot be conclusively proven. And the existence of a divine being or beings cannot be conclusively proven. Okay. So they have said that's faith, that's not reason. Okay, now they says these are our assumptions. Well, if they can't be proven, then aren't they faith? You see, we've made an argument here that many people don't stop to consider when they talk about a, a division between reason and faith. Reason would be impossible without faith. It is the human animal's ability to hypothesize, to assume the existence of something they have not seen and they cannot prove, or they may not be able to prove. It is the human ability to do that that makes higher level thinking possible. The scientist has hypothesis about why something in the universe works the way it does. He cannot prove that. Uh, he may be able to come up with a theory that would give strong evidence in favor of his hypothesis, but science is never settled. And just as Newton presented something that was true to some degree, later physicists uh, found his theory inadequate to explain everything and additional theories were offered. But the whole thing, Newton's theory or Einstein's theory, they began with a thought, an idea that perhaps the universe works like this. And if it does, we ought to expect X, Y, and Z to follow. These are the testable hypotheses. Uh, efforts were made to falsify the theory. The theories held up well uh, against the efforts to uh, demonstrate that they were not true. And so they were established as good, strong scientific theories. Uh, but they began with an unproven assumption that was perhaps intuitive at its most basic level. If I cannot prove something, but I believe it to be true, is that not by definition faith? And so the authors are going to present their faith system, at least their faith system when it comes to the subject of morality. Certain things that they assume to be true, and if these things are true, then they believe they will be able to build upon these assumptions, a workable and livable moral system. So what are the things they cannot conclusively prove, but assume to be the case? They assume that a moral system, in order to be workable and livable, must be rationally based. Again, when it comes to morality, they are rationalists, and yet not devoid of emotion, that sense of moral outrage. They assume that it must be logically consistent, 
but not rigid or inflexible. And they're going to unpack each of these things, so we're not going to take a lot of time talking about them right now. They assume it must be universalizable, uh, that it must have a general application to all humanity, and yet it has to be applicable and specific enough in a practical way so that individuals can use this system as they uh, confront various moral conflicts, as they face various situations that require them to make uh, a moral judgment or make uh, a particular or participate in a, one action or another. They assume that it has to be able to be taught or promulgated and they assume that there must be within the system some mechanism to resolve conflict. Minus these things, the authors suggest, you cannot have a workable, livable moral system that will work for everyone, if, for most of the people in the world, if not everyone in the world. The authors say that a, a workable moral system has to have emotion because they recognize that moral issues do have an emotional dimension, at least they always have. Now, I suppose you could come up with some moral system that would work on the planet Vulcan where everyone was like Spock and just pure rationalist, um, but moral systems in the real world have to somehow ring an emotional cord within us. And they say we cannot, however, make moral decisions solely based on emotion alone. And again, I don't like the synonym they use for intuitionism. Let's read that sense another way. But we cannot make moral decisions solely based on our moral intuition alone. Or we cannot accept the proposition that the conscience should be our guide. Why? Well, conscience is unreliable. Feelings are too unreliable and they're individualistic. And so we need, must have another basis for making our moral decisions that's fairer and more objective. So they're saying that emotion-based moral decisions or conscience-based moral decisions. A person that says, you know, I, I go with my conscience. I have this moral intuition when my inner elephant lurches, I, I go with that. And they would say, well, that's not fair. Oh, why not? Must a moral judgment be fair? For example, let's take a Ted Bundy, a brutal mass murderer who raped and murdered numerous dozens of young women. My moral sense is that's disgusting. That's despicable. He deserves whatever sentence society chooses uh, to use to punish its most heinous criminals. Now that's my gut reaction. Is it fair? Well, I don't really care if it's fair to Bundy or not. Does Do I have to be fair to Bundy? Okay, I'm going to give him a trial. Uh, but if he did it, uh, what more is needed? Are my feelings of, of disgust that are driving me to despise this man who committed these actions inappropriate? Am I somehow being unfair? Um, I, I don't think it follows that we cannot make our decisions based on our moral intuitions alone. Now, this is be where Jonathan Haidt and I would part company because I think he would agree that sometimes reason needs to ride that elephant right back into line so that it learns to lurch only at those things that we believe it should uh, lurch uh, toward. 
but that's another discussion. Are feelings unreliable? Is our conscience unreliable? Is it individualistic? Does everyone have a different one? Well, certainly our consciences are educated in particular cultures, but the moral instincts behind those cultural norms are hardly individualistic. I think this is one thing we have learned from the Yale Baby Studies and from the other work that has been referenced by Jonathan Haidt. We apparently have the same pre-wiring. As he said, we are you know, born righteous, but it's the culture that teaches what we're to be righteous about. So the culture applies some fixtures but I think it's very questionable when someone says, but we can't trust your moral instincts. Would you tell a, a, a goose that wants to fly south, you can't trust your instincts? Uh, why do we have them then? Uh, he says, we need something more objective, which is, of course, going to be reason. But is reason really more objective than intuition or emotion. When we discussed intuitionism, we pointed out that reason is hardly an objective evaluator. It's actually a response to our moral outrage. We see something and we're outraged by it. Our inner elephant lurches. And you say, what are you so upset about? Uh, uh, uh. Immediately we begin to explain our reason kicks in. And we justify our emotive response to events that we intuitively sense uh, to be immoral. This is how Jonathan Haidt explained it. Moral intuitions arise automatically, almost instantaneously, long before moral reasoning has a chance to get started. And those first intuitions tend to drive our later moral reasoning. Exactly so. Anything can be rationalized away. A rational argument can be made in favor of slavery and in favor of, of genocide. In fact, those who own slaves made rational arguments to defend the institution. And those who committed genocide and who committed today make rational arguments to defend what they are doing. Reason is hardly objective. This is why when we watch uh, television news programs, these programs they have on the e in the evening where you have point and counterpoint, two people on different sides of the issue, both are arguing and they're arguing rationally. Why then aren't they arguing the same thing? If both are being, ir being rational, how is it that they have two different opinions? Well, it goes back to those assumptions. Both of them assume something to be true, and on the basis of their unproven assumptions, their faith position, they have built a rational case. But in the final analysis, their ra reasoning, their rationalism, is not objective at all. It is an attempt to justify a gut reaction they have to a circumstance based on things they believe to be true fundamentally, things they assume to be so, uh, things that are hypothesis and ultimately faith. So I would suggest that reason is no more trustworthy as a moral guide than intuition. Well, setting aside my argument for a little bit, let's return to our author's argument that a moral system must have reason. It must be reason-based. Uh, that's what the word requirement means. It must be. The authors give some reasons for assuming what they assume. Uh, they say logical argument uh, includes supplying empirical evidence in support of one's position. And reasoning requires logical consistency, which involves avoiding fallacies and making sure 
that one's argument follows smoothly from one point to the next until it arrives at a logical conclusion. Well, I would suggest that in any debate, both sides attempt to provide empirical evidence in support of their position. One of the most important classes I took when I was a high school student was debate. And one of the things I learned in debate is that you can make a case for both sides of any argument. It's called sophistry. Uh, this is what lawyers do. If you go to a lawyer and, and you get there first, he'll make a logical case for your side in any lawsuit. If your next door neighbor who you want to sue gets there first, the attorney is going to make a logical argument uh, supporting his side of the case. That's what sophists do. And, and lawyers are professional sophists. I say that having a son who is an attorney, uh, but that's what they do. Uh, if he was hired by one company, he makes the logical case for their side. If he's hired by another company, he makes the logical argument for their side of the debate. Uh, logic can be employed and empirical evidence can be cited in support of any proposition that one wants to make. Logical consistency? Yeah. Uh, logical arguments can be made and they are perfectly consistent. But what about the premise? You see, a logical argument is only as sound as its premise. And so a lot of times I'll listen to an argument and I'll say, man, that is really good logic. And yet I, I know that that argument is not correct, but I can't find a problem with the logic. So how can I show that the argument is wrong if it's logically sound? Well, I look at the premises, what's assumed to be true. And in many cases, I can look at what a person is assuming to be true and I can show their assumption to be uh, wrong. Uh, so the logic is good, but the premise is faulty. Uh, logic does not necessarily require that everyone come to the same ultimate conclusion. The authors continue their defense of rationalism by saying reason requires a certain detachment from feelings. And this springs from reasoning's formality, which forces one to consider the truth and validity of what the individual and others are thinking or saying. Uh, funny, I haven't seen much of that in our political discourse in recent days. Uh, there is a, a formality to reasoning, but it's, it's interesting to watch these talking head programs on telev television and see uh, two people with PhDs going at each other. Uh, yeah, there is a certain uh, atmosphere in academia, which I love, and uh, I love it here in our offices on campus where we can talk about all sorts of issues and, and we can talk about them in a reasonable manner. But every once in a while, someone gets so involved that in the, the truth of their own rational argument that they close their mind to the other person's argument and they, they just check out. They are not going to listen to it. They are not going to consider that it might be true. I'm reminded of an old comic strip. Uh, some of you perhaps uh, are familiar with the comic strip, Peanuts, uh, Charlie Brown, and, and Snoopy. Well, in this particular comic strip, Snoopy was writing a, a book on theology. And Lucy, uh, the neighborhood cynic, is saying, what do you know about theology? And he says, well, I, have a, I know quite a bit. He's thinking to himself, I even have the perfect name for my book. Uh, the name of his theology book is going to be, has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? And many very rationalistic people who have very strong and well thought out arguments are completely close to the idea that there is a better argument on the other side or that there might be something wrong with their, their premise, uh, their assumptions. So reason doesn't require detachment at all. Theoretically, it would. Practically, it doesn't. The author says reason provides a common means by which differences in feelings and opinions and thoughts can be arbitrated. Really? Then why do we still have conflict in our society 
uh, among reasonable people. Reason only provides a means for making an argument. In and of itself, it does not provide a means for arriving at uh, the truth. Uh, it doesn't provide a, a, a true arbitration technique. Because a person who says, my reasoning is solid here, is going to run into someone else who says, so is mine. Well, maybe we have a court system that comes up with an answer. But then that, uh, that reasonable answer of the judge is appealed. And another reasonable judge or panel of judges overrules him. And they make a reason case uh, in favor of the other side of the lawsuit. And that's appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And you have nine reasonable individuals that consider it. And the decision is decided. Five of these reasonable individuals aside for one side and four for the other. And the next time there is a vacancy on the court, the same court may decide completely differently. Reason is not a panacea. And ultimately, I question whether the author is right that it is a better guide to moral reasoning and judgment than the moral intuitions we were born with. Let me cite Jonathan Haidt again. He wrote, don't take people's moral arguments at face value. They're mostly post hoc, that means after the fact, constructions made up on the fly, crafted to advance one or more strategic objective. Uh, this is what I've been trying to say. He, he says it more simply, more in more concise manner. And that going back to our talking head shows on TV, something has happened and they bring in two experts to talk about it. And on the fly, they have constructed their rational arguments. But when looked at closely, their arguments are carefully crafted to advance a strategic objective, or maybe more than one strategic objective. The reason was not summoned in an effort to discover the truth. Reason was employed uh, to advance an agenda, the particular PhD had before he was ever asked to opine on some situation in the news. Uh, reason doesn't change minds. Reason makes a person decide that their position is unassailable. We tend to look for those facts that support our side of the argument and discount those who oppose us. The authors then move on to their assumption that, and this really flows out of their idea of logic, that a moral system must be logically consistent to create stability. Now this takes us back to the one thing in rule non-consequentialism that the authors find attractive. The system was logically consistent and stable. But thinking of that system, the authors say it can't be a system that says something can never in any situation be done morally. That's too rigid. So to use an illustration, they look at rule non-consequentialism and say it's a one inch steel bar. It's unflexible. Now, when we talked about divine rule non-consequentialism, I attempted to make the case that that is not really fair. I looked at uh, the Jewish understanding of their own legal system, the law, the Torah, the 613 commandments. And uh, we found that there has been an ongoing conversation about how do we apply these commandments in the real world, an ongoing conversation ever since those rules uh, came on the scene. So the idea that there is a rigid, steel-like, uh, unbendable consistency in rule non-consequentialism is, I think, unfair. But the author says, 
I, I don't want anything approaching a steel bar. I want something that has some bend in it. Not too much. I want some rigidity. So I want a moral system where the rules are really hard to bend. But I do want a system where it is possible to bend those rules if necessary. And uh, when is that necessary? When a particular situation requires us to bend the rule. So, therefore, we must strive for logical consistency, but allow enough flexibility so that the system remains applicable. Uh, again, that's an assumption. I would argue that there is nothing in the older systems that the authors disparage that makes those systems inapplicable. They certainly were applicable for, uh, well, all of human history, uh, but certainly they're not applicable given the unspoken biases of the authors of our textbook. Now let's take a look at the author's insistence that a moral system that says something can never in any situation be done morally is too rigid. Well, let's consider first degree murder. The definite first degree murder is that it is never right to take the life of an innocent human being with malice and forethought. That's very rigid. Think with me. Can you think of an exception to that rule that would be morally justifiable? Remember, there's three elements. And when I've, I've done this with students in class, they'll give me an example. But I'll say, but you're not talking about an innocent human being. Uh, the person being killed must be uh, a person who does not deserve to be killed. They've done nothing uh, to merit the taking of their life. Uh, and there is that element of malice, hate, and forethought. Uh, you have either pre-planned it or on the spur of the moment, you had a second or two to think about it. You thought, mm, I think this person deserves to die. I'm going to go ahead and kill him. That's first degree murder. Where's the exception? What is too rigid about that? Now, if you go with the author's, number one principle that he's going to present again in the setting up of his moral system, that it is uh, wrong for one human being to take a life of another. Yeah, if you make that a rigid rule, then you're going to have some problems. But this is where his assessment of rule non-consequentialism is, in, in my opinion, not fair. Uh, you look at uh, the Torah, you find the command, thou shall not murder. And the old King James translation says, thou shalt not kill. That's really not a very good translation. It was good in 1611. But uh, for modern usage, it would be better to translate that, thou shalt not murder. But if you look at the rest of the Torah, you're going to find that there are uh, exceptions made to that rule. There are killings that are not murder. I say there's exceptions to the rule. There's exceptions to the way that rule is sometimes interpreted, that it's always wrong to kill. Uh, that's not what the law actually says, and that's not what it means. And the rest of the Torah makes that very clear. Uh, the Torah is a very realistic document. And in the case law, they give some examples in, in which a person might be accidentally killed. Uh, someone's in the wood chopping, the axe head flies off, hits the person, that person's killed. There was no malice. There was no forethought. An innocent human being did die. But that is not treated the same as what we would call first degree murder. So the author's idea that absolute rules cannot be made that allow for the complexity of human experience, uh, that an absolute system lacks the ability uh, to be applied to the complexity of life's issues. That's, uh, that's just not true uh, because uh, that has never been the way in which the rules that the author looks as inflexible and rigid have been applied. We now come to universality and particularity. The authors assume that in order for a moral system to work for all human beings, then it's got to be universal. We have an echo here of Immanuel Kant. 
the categorical imperative that if it's going to be a rule that is going to be adopted, it's got to be a rule that would be a good rule for everyone in the world. With respect to particularity, the authors say the rules that are made can't be so general that they have no real world application. Uh, for example, if we have a rule for the world, everyone should not worry, be happy. Well, okay, that's a nice little thought. How do I apply that in a practical way uh, to a situation I'm facing that has the potential of making me unhappy? I don't really get much guidance for that, or the guidance might not be good. I'm faced with a situation in which a, a certain human being uh, makes me unhappy. What am I supposed to do? Uh, put up with him? Well, I wouldn't be happy if I did that. Ah, do away with him. That would make me happy. Well, then I'd feel guilty. Hmm. It's a very impractical rule, this don't worry, be happy thing. The authors now move on to the subject of uh, the ability of a moral system to be taught and passed on, promulgated. Uh, they argue that if any moral system is to be applicable to more than one person, it must be able to be promulgated. That means you lay it out before other people. They say, oh, okay, I can see that. I can understand that. If the moral system is <laughs> written by lawyers in lawyer language, uh, very few people are going to be able to see it, read it, make sense of it. So it has to be something that can be easily presented and taught uh, so that uh, others can learn the system. So that's not just a system understood by the philosophers, but that the man on the street, that man or that woman uh, who has never taken a class in philosophy can learn this system. Uh, they may not like it. They may say, I don't like the rules. I have a rule here that I can't kill. I'm a murderer. That, that really inconveniences me. Tough. You understand the rule? Yeah, I understand the rule. You accept the rule? No. I, I, I'm, I'm going to reject this rule. Okay, then we're, we're going to put you in prison. Uh, but we're going to have the rule. You understand it? You understand the consequences of your actions if you break this rule? you are going to face those consequences if you don't curb yourself. Uh, so, so the authors argue that. And, and uh, as with the last rule, the universality and the uh, particularity rule, I, I have no further comment. I, uh, I accept their premise. Uh, can I prove that? No, but it, it's where I'm going to start my reasoning process, just as the authors start their reasoning process there as well. The authors suggest that any workable system of morality has to have a conflict resolution system built into it uh, so that you can participate in that society and know what the rules are and what the consequences are. What do you do when there's conflict between rules? The authors say if any moral theory or system proposes a series of duties and obligations that human beings ought to perform or be responsible for yet fails to tell people what they should do, when these conflicts arise, then the entire uh, theory is thrown into doubt. And uh, that is true. Uh, I should point out that the old divine rule system had that. Uh, the scholars of the Torah would agree that the commandments were given to the human race in a hierarchy, in order of importance. Uh, the greatest responsibility of humankind is to obey the first commandment. Uh, the the uh, Sixth greatest responsibility of humankind is not to kill each other. Uh, the, down the road, you have not bearing false witness. So there has to be a hierarchy of, of moral values in, in any moral system. The authors argue that. And uh, one of the reasons they don't like the divine rule system is they would say it doesn't have that. But uh, that's just not the case. I don't fault the authors for this. They, uh, their expertise is not in the area of theology. Uh, that just happens to be my area. And so I don't fault them uh, for ignorance. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense at all. Uh, they have uh, things that they understand that I'm completely ignorant of. I haven't had the opportunity to learn them. Uh, 
Uh, so um, I, I would agree with their basic point that, that you have to have some mechanism in place to resolve conflict. And ultimately, uh, this is why every workable moral system has always had some sort of a judicial process. In a hunter-gatherer culture, for example, you might have the village elders who meet together to resolve the conflict. Uh, in a, another type of uh, highly developed industrialized society, uh, you may have a very elaborate legal system with courts and lawyers and the whole old bailiwick. Um, but it, obviously there are going to be conflicts among human beings because as we've mentioned earlier, uh, human beings aren't perfect. I suppose if we were angels, we would not need laws at all, but we're not. And so if we were angels, we would not have conflict with one another, presumably, uh, but we do. Uh, so we're going to have to have some mechanism for dealing with that. Some additional thoughts. The authors say there are some other factors a workable system of morals and ethics must take into account. I would agree. And we've already discussed some of these things when we talked about natural law theory. So I want to share some additional thoughts of my own as we close this first lecture on Chapter 8. When we were discussing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the author said this, present day theories of human rights are the product of a long history of philosophical, religious, moral, and legal thinking in the West. But these assumptions do not necessarily carry over to non-Western cultures. I bring this up again because I believe it relates directly to the author's argument about universalizability. I would agree if we're going to try to come up with a new theory of morals and ethics to replace that which the various cultures of the world have believed before the advent of Jacques Thoreau, then we're going to have to have something that the whole world can buy into. I am not sure that this theory meets the bill. You see, there is that non-Western world, and most of the people in the world live in that non-Western world. And as Jonathan Haidt has shown, the rest of the world has a much broader palette uh, than those of us who live in the West. Haidt has identified six moral foundations uh, compared to taste buds. And most of the world's people live in traditional cultures, and they still operate on the basis of at least five to six of their moral intuitions. But Haidt has pointed out that here in the West, we tend to suppress all but two of our moral intuitions, care and fairness. And, and you've seen that uh, in this chapter when the author rejected intuitionism because he, he said, it's not fair. We need something fairer. And in saying that, whether the author is aware of it or not, he is appealing to a moral intuitionism, uh, a moral intu intuition, a moral foundation uh, that he has. And his elephant lurched at the thought that intuitionism would provide us with a system that would not be fair. And the other thing is caring. So what this means is when broken down, the West presently has just two uh, moral intuitions. They have taught themselves to suppress the rest. So it, you have a problem between the West and the non-Western world, or between the minority world, the 16.2% that are secular in their orientation, non-religious in their orientation, and the rest of the world that is still very religious. And on the basis of their religious training, they have a well-developed, perfectly operating set of moral intuitions. And this theory, as we are going to see when it's presented, is going to uh, be a system that fits very well for a secular culture such as the one we are living in at the present moment. But the rest of the world is frankly offended at a culture 
that is so stunted in its moral reasoning that it cannot see beyond care and fairness. I love the illustration Jonathan Haidt uses to explain this. He writes, Western secular moralities are like cuisines that try to activate just one or two of the receptors, moral intuitions, either concerns about harm and suffering or concerns about fairness and injustice. But people have so many other powerful moral intuitions, such as those related to liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And therein we have a problem. And the problem can be expressed in a question. Can any system that rejects the moral intuitions of the majority of the human race ever hope to achieve universalizability.